The next 24 hours are the most critical for the Battle of Avdivka, which has pitted the Ukrainian 110th Mech Brigade and the 3rd Assault Brigade against, by some accounts, up to three Russian combined armies. And the situation is critical. Now, it's not going to be a deciding factor on whether Ukraine wins the war, but certainly the Battle of Avdivka could determine if you, Ukraine loses it. Let's talk about what's going on. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Okay, so this is the latest updates from Deep State Map about the uh, Battle of Avdivka. You can see one of the most critical aspects here uh, that's worried me at least is this situation right here. You can see there's there was just a narrow gap of just a few, really uh, about a hundred meters, where the defending elements here of this. Uh, Zenit defensive position would be able to conduct a controlled withdrawal. And despite being nearly encircled by the Russians, it seems like that withdrawal was able to be affected. We know that the third assault brigade, at least in some statements, has alluded to having to fight, quote, 360 degree battles. I think that's a reference to making this evacuation, holding this perimeter, allowing the defenders to withdraw and then conducting a withdrawal themselves. So you can see here in the last 24 hours, it shows that this hole in the lines has been closed. Generally, what, what what I think you would see is if if these forces were surrounded or cut off, like you saw in the Mariupol steel plant, you would you would see that final cutoff happen. But the fact that we saw a remaining corridor indicates to me that that likely most or at least many of the defenders made it out uh, without too much of an incident. OK, but that's a long way from the situation becoming uh, stable, right? We can see here that the other large problem that Ukrainian forces are facing is the fact that Russian forces have penetrated through this entire area. Critically, this highway, one of the main thoroughfares leading into and out of Avdivka. They're also, of course, rolling Ukrainian forces here along these windbreaks near Les Dutch. Uh, and plunging as fast as they possibly can towards the only remaining stable paved route out of the city. And the fact is that while Ukrainian forces have a lot of terrain here, remember, at this point in the war, most of this turf is likely minefields. It could even be Ukrainian deployed minefields. So the issue here that we've seen in a lot of the war is that, uh, like the Ukrainian counteroffensive, the belief was that if they could just get two Russian lines, uh, right, no military force deploys minefields behind its lines, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Sometimes if you have this like defense in depth and you have like two or three trench lines, you may deploy a limited number of minefields um, between those positions. But in a, as a general rule, if you can get behind your enemy's positions, you're going to have a much clearer and more straightforward time operating. And the fear is that that's what we're seeing here. As Russian forces can break through Ukrainian defensive lines, Ukrainians are going to have a tougher time stabilizing the situation. Now, the 3rd Brigade that was brought in here, they have their work cut out for them. Uh, they appear to be again, affecting this withdrawal here, the most critical region. Uh, and now they have to find a way to roll back this perimeter here without having the situation become a route. Remember, guys, a route is when a military force is conducting a withdrawal, but it does so in a such a chaotic way that the enemy becomes emboldened and it sort of accidentally becomes an enemy attack. Too many people are trying to fall back and not enough are doing the fighting. So the key to avoid a route is to have a good withdrawal plan where one designated element engages in fighting, another element withdraws to new positions and establishes contact with the enemy. And then that element that was fighting, they begin their withdrawal, right? So someone's always fighting the enemy, but you're you're fighting backwards like a like a like a uh, an MMA fighter right on the back foot stepping back through the cage but always throwing strikes and always staying within striking distance. That's kind of how this needs to go for Ukrainian forces. Now, when we look over here at the live UA map, you can see they've depicted the situation a bit differently. They also show the collapse of the Zenit defensive position. Um, they're also showing Russian forces advancing a bit more along this north 
uh, Western perimeter here. Um, but it's critically, they are showing Russian forces as having limited themselves, limited their operations to this roadway here, cutting it off. But the secondary roadway, I don't even think it has a name. Um, this is purportedly still at least somewhat open. Now you can see here, right? It's tough in a lot of places. This actually looks slightly flooded, um, but it's still highly possible to get tracked vehicles and wheeled vehicles out of the battlefield through this route here. Um, but it does involve in passing dangerously close to Russian positions. Um, there's basically no option here that doesn't involve dang getting danger close to Russian positions. Now, this is the this is the fight that the third brigade has it's got to hold off this prong here in the north it's got to hold off this prong here in the south and it has to maintain contact as they withdraw through the city now a city can actually be now remember this is pre-war avdivka most of these buildings have been obliterated but the advantage of an urban area is that it actually can be take a long time for an attacking force to clear it right they can't just bypass whole blocks of cities right or whole blocks of buildings they've got to clear each individual building so you can have a relatively limited force conducting this defensive fight maintaining contact while larger numbers of troops can withdraw so it is not yet a disaster, but if Russia is able to conduct one more penetrating attack and establish even limited fires over this roadway, uh, it's going to become a really dangerous level of encirclement. And the reason it's so dangerous is, first off, when you commit a second brigade to a fight, as we've seen with the third, uh, you have a situation where now you've raised the stakes, right? You've taken, you've already bid one brigade. And now you've bid a second brigade into Avdivka. And bear in mind, the entire Ukraine counteroffensive, the massive, massive operation was total, a nine total brigades of perfectly good equipment. And we've, it's been very public that Ukrainian leadership has said, hey, we have a really hard time filling our ranks. We, we can't get fresh recruits and we definitely can't get combat tested soldiers. So to lose two brigades of combat experienced soldiers and all of their equipment, which as I've pointed out, there is currently no sign that the Ukraine aid bill is going to make it through the house. Uh, that all combines with the fact that Ukraine doesn't have two brigades to lose. So if they end up down two brigades and all of their equipment, right, which, which would be the worst case scenario for the Battle of Avdivka, Ukraine honestly will probably very strongly have to consider suing for peace because it's not clear on how they'll be able to sustain the fight against Russia um, with two more brigades wiped off the map. Now, that's the worst case scenario. Best case scenario is 95 to 90% of the brigade's personnel and equipment affect a withdrawal, dig into new positions, and the Russians have to run the same playbook again against even imp better improved Ukrainian defensive positions. Because remember, right, if we, let's see if we can back up, if we can back up the map here, let's see if we can get away with it, right? If you back it up to November 1st, uh, well, okay, that won't let us do it. But let's see if we can get the map back months. You can see that Avdivka, even months ago, was still a a, a a town that was almost encircled. It was partially encircled at baseline. So for these, uh, you know, for the Russians, they had already way earlier in the war done 60% of the work of this fight, right, of this encirclement, right? You can see here we are around Christmas time two months ago. You see what we're talking about, right? Avdivka is already kind of sort of encircled, um, or at least is is in danger of being encircled. So, it, you know, thousands of lives, Russian lives, and uh, dozens and dozens of Russian armored vehicles uh, over the course of two months have allowed them to sort of encircle the town of Avdivka. But if they have to run the same playbook again on Orlivka or uh, Tonenki or Siev Severne, right? They're they're going to have a harder time because there's a little less encirclement happening here. It's a little closer to just a regular linear battlefield. So Russia's number one advantage is kind of going to be cut off. So all this to say, guys, that the next. 24 to 48 hours are going to really determine if Ukraine and in, in, in their some of their best combat troops and some of their best equipment live to fight another day. 
Anyway, that's all I had, guys. Hit like and subscribe, and a huge thank you to the members of CombatVetNews.com. I could not do this without you guys. I appreciate all you. We've actually today just dropped a video looking at the uh, uncensored combat footage coming out of Avdivka, and it is some crazy stuff. Anyway, see ya. Cheers.